Whenever current flows through a wire, it creates a magnetic field around it. But if we want that field to be stronger and more focused, we can coil the wire tightly around a core. That's the simplest form of an inductor, a coil of wire acting like a tiny electromagnet. The core can be made of different materials, sometimes just air, sometimes iron or other materials that help the inductor perform better. On a circuit diagram, we draw an inductor as a little squiggly line that looks a bit like a spring. Now, let's see why inductors actually matter. Imagine a simple circuit with a light bulb. We start changing the voltage in small steps and watch what happens. If we plot voltage and current over time, the current tracks the voltage instantly, step for step exactly as Ohm's law predicts. The bulb's brightness rises and falls right along with the voltage. Nothing unusual, nothing dramatic. In fact, it's almost boring. But now, let's add an inductor in series with the bulb and see what happens. At first, with a steady voltage, nothing seems different. The current is the same, and it almost feels like the inductor isn't doing anything at all. But the moment we suddenly raise the voltage, everything changes. The current doesn't leap up right away. It climbs slowly, as if the coil is dragging its feet. Eventually, it reaches the same level as before, but it takes a bit of time to get there. And if we keep changing the voltage in steps, the same thing happens again and again. The current never snaps instantly into place. It eases its way up or down, nice and gradual. It's almost like the coil is saying, whoa there, let's smooth this out a bit. And that's inductance in a nutshell. It's the tendency of a conductor to resist changes in current. When the current is steady, an inductor is practically invisible, behaving just like an ordinary piece of wire. But the moment the current starts to change, the inductor pushes back. This behavior can be incredibly useful in some situations, but in others, it can cause some serious headaches. And that's exactly what we're going to dig into in this video. Let's try to make sense of this behavior with a water analogy. Imagine two pistons, each half full of water, connected by a pipe. If you push down on piston A, water flows through the pipe into piston B. Why? Because your push increases the pressure in piston A, and water naturally moves from high pressure to low pressure. The same thing happens in an electrical circuit. A battery has two terminals, positive and negative. The positive side is at a higher potential, and the negative side is at a lower potential. Connect them with a wire, and current flows from positive to negative. And just to clear up a common detail, in reality, electrons move the other way, but by convention, we say the current flows from positive to negative. Now, back to our pistons. If you push harder, more water flows. Pull back, and the flow slows down. Push the other way, and the flow reverses. In this setup, the water flow responds instantly to whatever force you apply. But what if we tweak the setup a little? This time, let's put a heavy water wheel right in the middle of the pipe. Now when you push on piston A, the water can't move freely until the wheel starts to spin. And because the wheel has inertia, it doesn't spin up instantly. It takes time to get going. As it speeds up, the water flow gradually increases, and eventually it settles in to a steady rate. If we were to plot this, we'd see something interesting. At first, with no push on the piston, there's no flow at all. Then, when we suddenly apply force, the water doesn't surge through right away. The wheel has to spin up first. The flow ramps up slowly until it reaches a steady level. And when you stop pushing, the wheel doesn't just freeze in place. It keeps spinning for a while, using its stored momentum to keep the water moving before finally slowing down and stopping. If we compare the force and flow rate graphs, the difference becomes clear. The flow always lags behind the force. That's because the water wheel has inertia. It resists changes to its motion. It doesn't like starting or stopping suddenly. There are three key things to notice here. 
First, the water wheel delays the increase of water flow when you start pushing. Second, it also delays the decrease of flow when you stop pushing. And third, and most importantly, when the force stays constant, the flow stays steady too. In that case, it's almost as if the water wheel isn't there at all. Now, let's try changing the force on the piston continuously, pushing and pulling it back and forth. You'll notice that the water flow doesn't respond instantly. Just like before, the wheel resists sudden shifts in flow. Even when the force changes smoothly, the flow still takes a little time to catch up. The result? The water flow always lags behind the force. So we can sum up all the behaviors of the water wheel like this. When the flow is steady, the wheel does nothing at all. But the moment the flow tries to change, the wheel pushes back, delaying that change. That means the water wheel doesn't resist the flow itself, it only resists changes in the flow. And that's exactly how an inductor behaves in a circuit. When the current stays constant, the inductor just sits there quietly, acting like an ordinary piece of wire. But when the current tries to change, the inductor resists, causing the current to lag behind the voltage. The voltage across the inductor always leads the current. And this effect is called inductive reactance. And here's the key point. Inductive reactance doesn't appear in DC circuits because the current is constant. It only shows up when the current is changing, like in AC circuits, or when a switch is suddenly flipped. By now, you should have a good sense of what inductors are and what they do. It's simply oppose the current changes in a circuit. But let's dig deeper and ask, why does an inductor oppose changes in current? As we've already said, an inductor is basically an electromagnet. And for any electromagnet, its magnetic field is directly proportional to the current flowing through it. When we first switch it on, the inductor needs energy to build up that magnetic field. At the very beginning, the field is zero, so the applied voltage drops entirely across the inductor. As the field grows, the inductor stores more and more energy, and at the same time, the current through it gradually rises. But what happens if we suddenly turn off the switch and try to stop the current? The magnetic field doesn't just vanish instantly. Instead, it pushes back, releasing its stored energy to keep the electrons moving in the same direction. If the inductor has a path to release that energy, the current will keep flowing smoothly for a little while. But if the circuit is cut off abruptly, the energy has nowhere to go. The inductor reacts by generating a very high voltage across the open gap, sometimes strong enough to make a spark jump across the switch. That's why, in real circuits, we often add protective components like snubber circuits or flyback diodes. They give the inductor a safe way to release its stored energy, preventing damaging voltage spikes, or little shocks to your fingers. Now let's run an experiment to discover how voltage and current relate in an inductor. First, I connect a voltmeter across the inductor to measure its voltage. Then I add an ammeter in series to measure the current. I also include a small light bulb in series. It limits the current, like a resistor, and its brightness gives a nice visual cue for flow. Finally, I hook the circuit to a signal generator set to a square wave. Now let's plot three things, the supply voltage, the voltage across the inductor, and the current through it. At first, you might expect all three to match the square wave coming from the signal generator, but that's not what actually happens. Even though we're applying a perfect square wave, the inductor's voltage and current behave very differently. Pay close attention to the voltage across the inductor and the current flowing through it. If we analyze the data carefully, a clear pattern appears. The voltage across the inductor is always proportional to how quickly the current is changing, what we call the rate of change of current over time, or in calculus terms, the first derivative of current with respect to time. 
Notice the parts of the graph where the current is rising or falling. The voltage at those moments is clearly not zero. But in the flat sections, where the current is steady and unchanging, the voltage across the inductor drops to zero. In other words, the inductor only reacts when the current is changing. When the current is constant, it stays quiet. But the moment the current starts to change, the inductor pushes back, creating a voltage that opposes that change. We can repeat this experiment using different input signals to see if the same relationship holds. For example, let's use a sine wave this time. When we plot the results, something interesting appears. The voltage across the inductor follows a sine wave, while the current follows a cosine wave. In other words, the current lags behind the voltage by 90 degrees. If we take the first derivative of the current, we get a sine wave, which perfectly matches the voltage waveform. That confirms our relationship once again. The voltage across an inductor is directly proportional to the rate of change of current. No matter what waveform we use, square, sine, or anything else, the same rule always applies. This is the fundamental relationship between voltage and current in an inductor. With this understanding, let's move on to define inductance. If the voltage across an inductor is proportional to how quickly the current changes, we can express that relationship with a constant of proportionality. This constant depends on the physical dimensions and construction of the inductor, and that's what we call inductance. In simple terms, inductance is the amount of voltage that appears across a coil when the current through it changes at a rate of 1 ampere per second, opposing that change. Its unit is the volt second per ampere, or more simply, the Henry, symbol H, named in honor of the American inventor Joseph Henry. The inductance of a coil depends on its physical dimensions and construction. For example, in a solenoid-type inductor, the inductance is determined by four main factors, the number of turns in the coil, the length of the coil, the cross-sectional area, and the magnetic permeability of the core material. We can increase the inductance by adding more turns to the coil, using a material with higher magnetic permeability for the core, increasing the cross-sectional area, or shortening the length of the coil. Just like capacitors, inductors come in many types and values. Practical inductors can range from just a few microhenries, used in communication circuits, all the way up to several henries, which are common in power systems. Inductors can be fixed or variable, and their cores may be made from materials like iron, steel, ferrite, plastic, or even air, depending on the application. And that wraps up our deep dive into inductors, what they are, how they behave, and why they're so important in circuits. If you enjoyed this video and learned something new, consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support helps us keep creating more clear, visual, and engaging science and engineering videos just like this one. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you won't miss our next episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.